perfect. Thank you, Claudio. On behalf of the Centro de Arbitraje y Mediación de la Cámara de Comercio de Santiago, the Arbitration and Mediation Center of the Santiago Chamber of Commerce, also known as Camp Santiago, at the Faculty of Law at the Universidad de Chile, I warmly welcome you to the final class of the second edition of our postgraduate diploma on national and international arbitration. This program took place between August and November of this year. The main objective pursued by the 30 students of this academic program was to acquire theoretical and practical knowledge about the main features of arbitration, along with world leading academics and practitioners. In fact, our students were able to learn from 40 different professors from Chile and abroad. With the aim of promoting access to specialized knowledge in arbitration and contributing to the internationalization of University of Chile and Camp Santiago, the opening and closing conferences of this postgraduate diploma are open to the general public. And in each edition, we have invited distinguished international scholars and arbitrators. In this context, we are truly honored to have Dr. Trina Baltag, who will deliver a conference entitled International Investment Arbitration and Human Rights. Dr. Baltag holds a PhD degree in international arbitration from Queen Mary University of London, a, an LLM in international commercial arbitration law from Stockholm University, a Master in Sciences in International Businesses from the Academy of Economicus, Economic Studies in Romania, and an LLB from the University of Bucharest. She also holds a postgraduate certificate in teaching in higher education, and she is fellow of the UK Higher Education Academy. Dr. Christina Balta is Associate Professor in International Arbitration and Academic Director of the International Commercial Arbitration LLM at Stockholm University, and she's also a member of the Stockholm Chamber of Commerce Arbitration Institute's board. Dr. Baltag is a qualified attorney at law, member of the Romanian and Bucharest Bar, with extensive practice in international commercial and investment arbitration, international dispute resolution, private and public international law. She has also been appointed in numerous arbitrations as a president, sole and co-arbitrator under the rules of the main dispute resolution institutions across the world. Dr. Valgas, Valtag, sorry, expertise, focuses on arbitrations concerning foreign investments, financial transactions, construction and energy projects, investment disputes, sale of goods contracts, service and IP contracts, among others. Thank you very much, Dr. Valtag, for being today with us and for accepting our invitation to give the closing conference of our arbitration diploma. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Salah, and thank you very much to Cam Santiago and to the University of Chile. It's, it is an honor to support uh, the, the program and to congratulate you for the second successful year of, of, uh, of the program. And I encourage everybody to, to join it if they have the possibility. Um, the topic of today's uh, lecture is international investment arbitration and human rights. And I was mentioning uh, earlier uh, uh, to my colleagues that is, uh, uh, very interesting that we see developments happening every day and, and to some extent very difficult to keep up uh, with this uh, interesting interaction between uh, the two topics. Just by way of introduction, as we know, uh, we, in the past years, we've discussed about the fragmentation of public international law, uh, meaning that uh, in public international law, we, we, we could see the separation of different branches for example, investment law, uh, we had human rights uh, uh, and so on and so forth. What, what we could see uh, in more recent years is the reverse uh, uh, process of fragmentation that is more interaction in between uh, the, the branches, the arms of public international law. And one very relevant interaction is this one between human rights law and uh, international investment law and arbitration. Uh, I will start by uh, uh, sharing the screen uh, just in a second with the slideshow, and I hope that everybody can see. Um, 
just just by way of, of introduction uh, to to the benefits of, of all participants, uh, this is not going to be a lecture on human rights, uh, but I wanted to just put the the discussion in perspective and and start by, of course, looking a bit at uh, human rights. And of course, we are all familiar with the 1948 Universal Declar Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, in the few uh, paragraphs uh, uh, talking about the most important, the fundamental rights, uh, starting to, with the right to life, liberty, and security of person, uh, going through the variations, obviously, of this fundamental right, for example, that nobody should be held in slavery or servitude. And of course, uh, going to the articles seven and eight, which are very relevant to us, uh, uh, the practitioners in dispute resolution in general, uh, looking at the equality before uh, the law, and of course, the right to an effective remedy before the competent national tribunals. And all this we see, obviously, in different expressions, also when it comes to foreign investments, uh, and in particular to the rights uh, that foreign invest investors uh, benefit um, from by way of international treaties. The European Convention on Human Rights obviously is one of the first expression, proper expression uh, of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in terms of, of uh, enforceable framework for this fundamental rights. Uh, and, and it came into force in 1953. Uh, we see a lot of developments happening in the sphere of the European Court uh, of Human Rights and the European Convention on Human Rights that I'll touch upon in particular uh, at, at the end of my presentation. Uh, why is it important to, to start by looking at human rights? Uh, because obviously the, the beneficiaries of the human rights are the individuals. Uh, and at the same time, when we talk about human rights, we cannot dissociate uh, this from the obligations that states have uh, in particular uh, into fulfilling the human rights that I'll, 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 I'll touch upon uh, in a second. But when we look at the human rights from the perspective of individuals, obviously they have the five uh, essential characteristics that are very important for our discussions today as well. Uh, first of all, they are universal. So uh, regardless of political, economic, or cultural system, uh, they are inalienable, of course, except for uh, uh, um, uh, exceptional cir circumstances. And of course, with due process, uh, a human right is inherent. Human rights are inherent to all persons and cannot be alienated. Um, now, more importantly for the discussion today, they are interrelated, interdep uh, in interdependent and indivisible. Uh, and this is very important to stress uh, because the interrelation is very, uh, it's, it, it is an essential attribute characteristic of human rights. Uh, the improvement in the realization of any one of human rights is a function of the realization of the other human rights. So when we talk about due process, for example, uh, uh, or effective remedy before a court or national court, we essentially need, for example, the equality before law of individuals uh, at, at the same time with uh, nobody can be held in slavery. It's obviously essential to look into the context of the right to life uh, and so on and so forth. And, and I'll, you, you, when we'll get the, to, to the relevant part of, of the lecture today, you'll see this, uh, as I was saying, even more proeminently. They're interdependent. Uh, similar to the interrelated characteristics, the human rights are inter interdependent, meaning that the enjoyment of anyone is dependent on the re level of realization of the other rights. Uh, um, and also indivisible, meaning that uh, the, the any improvement in the enjoyment of any right cannot be at the expense of the re realization of any other right. Now, all these characteristics of of course, they must be put in the context of what the states have to do in relation to human rights. Uh, and of course, the st a state has to respect human rights, meaning that uh, it has to refrain from interfering with the enjoyment of, of human rights. But more importantly, and this is where we move to, again, uh, the relevant part for our discussion today, states have to protect and to fulfill human rights. 
And states have to protect human rights, uh, 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 meaning that they have to pre prevent private actors or third parties from violating human rights. A, a point that was raised uh, in the context of uh, a one particular investment arbitration case, the Ubra versus Argentina, and then to fulfill the human rights. And this is where the focus of our attention in the past year has been quite significantly because states, they must take a positive measure. They have to be proactive in ensuring that they include, they adopt proper legislation, policies, programs that ensure the realization of human rights. So when we look at this broader pictures of fundamental human rights, obviously they're inherent to any individual. Uh, they are interdependent, they have to be uh, looked at as, as a togetherness, uh, but also the states and the role of the states in protecting and fulfilling this human rights is very relevant. Now, uh, the, the discussion will move uh, from this point to what interests us in, 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 the, in the sphere of uh, in investment, or investment law and arbitration. And one very topical discussion in the past years has been obviously uh, climate change. Um, and the fact that we have to transition to a clean energy. And therefore, we need uh, as individuals to um, uh, push ourselves to implement uh, a better behavior that is uh, um, in line with the climate change policies, uh, mitigation and adaptation, but also states uh, in addition to um, uh, their commitments at national and international level, they need to move to a to a, a point where they need to uh, ensure that there are sufficient foreign investments that will help the transition to a clean energy and therefore uh, help implementing climate change policies of mitigation and adaptation. At the same time with having to terminate or uh, uh, over-regulate, if one would like to use this term, uh, in the sphere of those investments that are negatively effective, affecting the environment. So the, the, the probably the most prominent part of investment arbitration, investment law and arbitration that we see today where human rights interact or will increasingly interact with investment law is climate change and the uh, aspects of the right of the state to regulate in the sphere of uh, climate change and environment. And this is something that was highlighted by uh, the Queen Mary and uh, uh, Pinson Mason uh, recent survey in 2022, the future of international energy arbitration. Uh, and I uh, recommend and commend the survey uh, because uh, in certain parts it's, it's truly an eye opener uh, and, and uh, probably will uh, help us predict but also uh, adapt or help uh, the arbitration community implement certain measures that will uh, increase the legitimacy of arbitration. Now, the survey uh, uh, in two of the questions, uh, questions 13 and 17, uh, looks at what types of energy disputes will, will mostly increase due to climate change. And in, interestingly, uh, ranked the first, uh, uh, we look at increased regulation, including energy transition measures adopted by states. And when I look at question 17, it mirrors uh, uh, the answers in question 13. What changes arising from the energy transition uh, are likely to give rise to disputes? And of course, on the first uh, place would be regulatory changing, including the state's implementation of treaties, notably the Paris Agreement. Um, now, with this in mind, uh, it is also important to look at um, uh, the, the topic of climate change, environment, obligations of states, I was saying at national and international level, uh, but also the obligation of states to ensure um, that 
human rights are uh, uh, fulfilled uh, and protected, uh, we need to look perhaps broadly at what states are currently doing when it comes to um, uh, uh, energy transition or transition to a clean energy. And a very recent hot from the oven, as we say, uh, um, study of um, UNCTAD uh, in the Investment Policy Monitor, uh, which was released at the end of uh, last week. Um, uh, and again, I recommend uh, the study is focused on uh, investment policies for the energy transition incentive and disincentives. And it has a lot of interesting features uh, and points uh, related to the transition to uh, clean energy, climate change obligations, adaptation and mitigation and so on. Uh, but it has, uh, uh, it identifies very interestingly what is currently happening uh, from the perspective of develop, develop the, uh, de developed countries, less developed countries in in terms of what 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 are the ongoing um, let's say um, uh, actions of the states when it comes to transitioning out of the fossil fuel and into renewable energy, and uh, one of the um, key findings of the UNCTAD uh, study refers to the. Uh, international commitments on uh, fossil fuel subsidies reduction, uh, because this is one of the key aspects uh, in, in the transition uh, to a clean energy is stop promoting fossil fuels, including, including by way of removing the subsidies and uh, making sure that the regulatory framework is in place for uh, renewable energy sources. Uh, and here you see, I'm not going to, to get into uh, a lot of detail, but you, you see summarized what at the international level, what states committed to do in relation to fossil fuel uh, uh, reduction. And we have obviously the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals uh, in 2015, uh, or where the United Nations called the countries to rationalize insufficient fossil fuel subsidies that encourage waste consumption. We have the Paris Agreement uh, also in 2015, which includes a commitment to making finance flows consistent with a pathway towards low greenhouse gas emissions and uh, climate resilient development, which includes obviously the phase out of fossil fuel subsidies. Um, the COP27 in Sharm el Sheikh, uh, which uh, probably for, for those less familiar, uh, at the end of the COP27 uh, in Sharm el Sheikh, the, the declaration which was adopted at the end of the COP uh, was very important, not only in highlighting uh, um, the fact that uh, uh, the states have to commit to accelerate the phase out of, of uh, insufficient fossil fuel subsidies, but in the declaration, there is also, um, uh, let's say, um, there, there are numbers put uh, on the transition to a clean energy. Uh, uh, there is a red flag uh, um, as to how much one would need to, um, uh, to transition to a clean energy, how much is needed in terms of finances to phase out fossil fuel, but also highlighting, and we're talking about trillions of US dollars per year, uh, but also the fact that economies, they have to keep up to accompany this transition. So it's not only we need to invest more into renewable energy and we have to wipe out the fossil fuel uh, energy resources and investments, but also the fact that the economists themselves, they have to be prepared to receive and to work with uh, renewable energy. Uh, also, uh, another uh, interesting aspect of the um, uh, uh, of the UNCTAD um, uh, investment policy monitor that I mentioned and uh, uh, made available at the end of last week, and you find it available online. Um, they, it looks at the policies uh, which are key uh, for um, uh, increasing investments in uh, clean energy 
uh, in the clean energy sector. And of course, this they differ depending on uh, the, the, the status of, of each economy, if it's a developed economy, developing economy, by the classification of UNCTAD and so on. But you see here in this beautiful uh, concentric circles, uh, at the heart of it, you have the regulatory framework, uh, which uh, uh, besides regulation, uh, broadly speaking, it, it, it looks at specific measures that must be implemented uh, by the states um including at more holistic level at national strategy and targets for renewable energy uh but also for example uh market liber liberalization uh the for the electricity access to grill and dispatch and so on and so forth um and you also see here identify the renewable energy uh, technologies uh and uh, uh the clean electricity generation but all in all, why uh, is this uh, uh, relevant for our discussion? It is relevant in the context of um, uh, the regulatory framework that has to be implemented by states. Uh, and, and you see here one last uh, um, conclusion of the UNCTAD uh, investment policy monitor uh, that we have regulation is at the heart of the transition to a clean energy, uh, climate change adaptation and mitigation. And the regulatory power of the states as we're going to see in a minute as well, it is at the heart of uh, the implementation, the fulfillment, the protection of the fundamental human rights. This is the ultimate expression of how states make sure that human rights, the right to life, and we're going to see in a second, another fundamental right recently recognized uh, is fulfilled. Uh, and this is reflected in uh, the in internal space in compliance with the international commitments. Now, because the individual actions of it, each state, uh, when we talk about climate change, uh, are not sufficient to tackle the major concern uh, of of uh, uh, the imminent uh, future uh, by 2050, it is predicted that, that the temperatures may rise with 1.5 degrees Celsius, which would trigger devastating consequences um, um, across the world, and in particular for small states and insular states. Uh, as I said, the individual efforts are not sufficient. This is why we have, as we could see, all these international commitments uh, and, and projects. And of course, now in Dubai, uh, we have uh, uh, the COP meeting uh, and uh, probably more stringent measures would come out of that as well. This is why we need a more uh, uh, international uh, uh, combined effort of states. Uh, and this has happened constantly in the past years, culminating with uh, 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 July uh, 2022, when the United Nations uh, has voted in the General Assembly uh, to uh, recognize the, uh, the right, uh, the fundamental right to a clean, healthy and stable environment. Uh, so let me take you back to the beginning of our discussion. I was referring to the fundamental human rights as recognized, obviously, by the declaration, the UN declaration, and also further codified and enforced in the European Convention on Human Rights, and of course, other treaties around the world um, uh, for tackling climate change and the devastating effects uh, of, of CO2 emission increase. Uh, probably uh, the the only way forward was uh, to have a formal recognition that the right to life uh, would not necessarily cover uh, the the also the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. So this was a first first I would call it critical development in the past years, uh, and we'll probably see more. Uh, critical developments uh, happening in the near future. One of them is uh, the request to uh, by the also by the General Assembly of the United Nations this year in March, March 2023, uh, uh, the request to the International Court of Justice to adopt a resolution 
uh, uh, concerning the state's obligation on climate change. Uh, and this was an initiative of uh, uh, Vanuatu and other uh, small and insular states um, uh, in, in, in regard to the consequences uh, that um, um, uh, had on climate change by uh, the behavior of, of certain states. Uh, but broadly, this would mean uh, the advisory opinion of the ICJ would, would mean that we'll probably have, um, um, uh, uh, let's say, instrument that including uh, arbitral tribunals will have to uh, carefully consider uh, when looking at disputes involving uh, environmental issues, uh, climate change, uh, and related to this human rights, including the newly uh, recognized right to a clean, healthy, sustainable, and sustainable environment. And, and just to, to, to uh, uh, make a parallel to this, uh, it is uh, not uncommon to the contrary. It is common for investment tribunals to take a look at the uh, ICJ advisory opinions. Uh, we had, for example, in the context of uh, nationality uh, or uh, rather dual nationality, um, uh, also uh, in the context of uh, the nature of dispute resolution clauses, um, tribunals looked at uh, the ICJ advisory opinion, for example, the reparation for injuries opinion, uh, and so on and so forth. So, so this will have a significant impact, I would say, also in, uh, in uh, the reasoning interpretation of the treaties and the reasoning of investment tribunals. However, this um, um, request by the UN uh, General Assembly to the ICJ is not the only uh, request, uh, similar request um, um, sent in the past years. Uh, we saw, and this is probably uh, closer to uh, us today, uh, in January uh, 2023, uh, we had Colombia and Chile requesting an advisory opinion on the climate emergency and human rights, which was submitted to the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. Uh, and this was uh, framed as a request to clarify the scope of state obligations in their individual and collective dimension in order to respond to the climate emergency within the framework of international human rights law. Um, and of course, um, uh, with, with a view of uh, nature and uh, human survival on our planet. And we also had uh, the request for an advisory opinion, which was uh, uh, submitted by the Commission of Small Island States uh, to the International Tribunal for the Law of Sea uh, in December 2022. This is, um, I was saying, th this, this is a, a big movement uh, in the direction of having a more um, formalized position of uh, international tribunals and organizations when it comes to, first of all, the human right to life, uh, the human right to a clean, uh, safe uh, and stable environment, uh, and also the obligations of states in respect to protecting and fulfilling these fundamental rights of individuals, but also the responsibility of states towards other states uh, when it comes to the impact uh, on the very survival of the nations, of the states, uh, caused by the, uh, uh, um, their actions uh, in breach of the international commitments when it comes to climate change. And, and this is a, a discussion that goes beyond uh, um, investments, foreign investments, transition to a clean energy, um, uh, phasing out of fossil fuels, the fact that we have to commit um, and, 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 and have a firm um, conduct when it comes to addressing climate change. Uh, it is as the request of Colombia and Chile is put before the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, uh, the, the survival uh, on our planet. And uh, the other day, uh, in on 9 of November 2023, uh, Australia and Tuvalu signed the world's first climate resettlement treaty, uh, which is um, an interesting development, but at the same time, um, 
it puts in perspective the fact that some consequences are imminent uh, of, of climate change and we have to deal with them as soon as possible. Uh, for those of you uh, uh, less familiar with, with the nation, Tuvalu is a Pacific Island states. It has only 26 square kilometers uh, and a very small population is, uh, of about 11 uh, 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 thousand citizens. Um, the treaty between Australia and Tuvalu uh, recognize or uh, um, provides for a human mobility pathway, basically for the possibility of uh, uh, Falepili Union, uh, Falepili citizens, the Tuvalu citizens to relocate to Australia. Uh, because it is said that by 2050, uh, the land mass of the island would be uh, almost 100% covered by water. That means that Tuvalu is an island. It is expected that by 2050 uh, uh, to cease to exist. Uh, and that means that a solution has to be found uh, for the relocation of the citizens uh, to safer grounds. And this is the pathway uh, that was opened by Australia. Uh, there is a, obviously a cap uh, in the relocation of the citizens per year, but it's expected that every year uh, about 300 uh, Tuvalu citizens would be relocated to Australia. Uh, and um, uh, a recognition, uh, something that uh, uh, it has been discussed at the last meeting of uh, uh, the, the Confederation of Small States, uh, the fact that uh, um, it has to be recognized that the statehood and state sovereignty continues to exist even when the landmass of the nation will cease to exist itself. So we don't need the uh, uh, physical territory for the statehood to continue to be recognized. And this is what the treaty uh, between Australia and Tuvalu provides a safe space for the Tuvalu nation to continue to exist, even after 2050, when, as I said, it is expected that uh, the island will be covered 100% by water. And this is the uh, consequence of, um, obviously, climate change. Um, but again, uh, it is now the time to uh, consider this and as individuals and uh, states uh, to act and to react. Um, now, these are the international developments when it comes to uh, climate change, but of course uh, there are uh, developments at the local level before um, uh, local courts, um, some of them happening in Chile, um, uh, most of them happening in Europe, uh, where individuals uh, and, uh, and uh, organizations and NGOs uh, are trying to um, uh, put uh, some hard obligations on the states when it comes to um, uh, climate change uh, and relying on uh, uh, the right to life uh, as a human right and the obligations of the states to fulfill this right. Uh, I will not uh, uh, give you the full picture of this national litigations because they're quite numerous. Um, uh, and of course, we had uh, interesting uh, developments before the Supreme Court of the Netherlands in 2019 in the Urgenda case, uh, where the uh, Dutch Supreme Court uh, has stated that states uh, have an obligation to fulfill and protect the right to uh, private family life, which implied an obligation to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we also had the German Federal Constitutional Court in, uh, 2000, in uh, 2021 in the Bundesklimaschutzgesetz case, uh, where the German Federal Constitutional Court has stated that states not only have an obligation to reduce annual greenhouse gas emissions, uh, but they also have to do it in a timely manner. Before the European Court of Human Rights, 
There are currently three very important cases. The European Court of Human Rights has addressed environmental concerns in different cases before, but this three case is currently pending before the court. Uh, Verein Klima Seniorin in Schweiz, uh, Karem uh, versus Switzerland, Karem versus France, and Duarte D'Agostino versus Portugal are tackling exactly uh, uh, the, the climate change issue, the obligation of states and the right to life uh, as a fundamental right, obviously, in relation to um, uh, the uh, environmental impact of the actions of states. Um, and it is expected, because the hearings took place, it is expected to, to, to have a position of the uh, European Court of Human Rights uh, quite soon. Uh, but of course, these developments um, uh, that we see at international level and national level before different courts, as I was saying, uh, or different international organizations, they have to be or they have to go hand in hand uh, with what is happening at also regional regional level uh, um, in the, um, for example, the uh, European Union or in the in the Mercosur area or in the ASEAN area, where we at, at least at the regional level the the actions of 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 the members of uh, of uh, the union uh, they have to they can be coordinated more easily. Uh, however. Just going back to um, our discussion on investments uh, and what was mentioned at COP27 in Sharm el Sheikh uh, is the reality that um, while uh, we empower the states to protect and fulfill human rights, while we recognize the fundamental right to a clean environment uh, and the right to life in the broader sense as well, um, we cannot have a meaningful uh, transition to a clean energy and uh, deal with climate change uh, mitigation and adaptation in the absence of investments. And I was mentioning the, uh, uh, the, the Sharm el Sheikh declaration uh, that some numbers have be, been put on top of the, the, this effort uh, of, of uh, addressing all these changes and we're looking at trillions. Um, uh, specifically um, for investments in the renewable energy, it is expected by 2030 uh, uh, and as such to reach a net zero emissions that an investment of 4 trillion US dollars per year is needed. Uh, and to have this transformation, as I was mentioning earlier, uh, it is not sufficient to invest, invest in renewable energy if the economists themselves, they don't have the capacity to operate with renewable energy. At industrial level, this is probably the most significant impact on, on the environment. Uh, and in order to transform the economies, uh, we would need uh, about uh, 6 trillion US dollars per year. Uh, and this is left leaving outside the smaller costs with um, uh, phasing out the fossil fuel. So all in all, uh, we are looking at um, an increased effort or investment effort um, in order to meet all these uh, commitments. Now, um, what is interesting to uh, also highlight and going back is that there will be uh, a need as the uh, Queen Mary survey has highlighted an increased need of regulation uh, in the in in, uh, in 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 the space and at the same time a regulation that is coordinated across nations across unions uh, and at international level more broadly it is not sufficient for example for Germany to shut down all the nuclear power plants at the same time as, for example, Finland uh, opened the largest uh, nuclear uh, power plant uh, in Europe uh, just recently. At the same time, it is not sufficient for, uh, 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 for example, the, the Supreme Court of Norway uh, to look at the right to life and uh, um, reach the conclusion that this is not breached by granting additional uh, explo exploitation licenses in the North Sea at the same time with, um, for example, Denmark 
um, um, uh, phasing out the explo exploitation licenses in the North Sea for oil and gas developments. So a coordinated action on behalf of the states is needed. But how one can balance, obviously, the need to implement all these measures, regulating, heavily regulating, terminating investments with the fact that investments, they still need to be attracted in uh, uh, this renewable energy technologies uh, and so on and so forth. So the fundamental question that we have at the moment is, exactly this regulatory space of the state uh, triggered by the fact that human rights have to be fulfilled and protected with the same time uh, at the same time with recognizing that investors and their their investments they are protected uh, and they have and they benefit from certain rights uh, standards already granted to them at the time when they have made the investment uh, or in the future when they will make the investment. So this the space of the interaction of human rights uh, and investment arbitration, in particular before investment tribunals, ICSID and non-ICSID investment tribunals, uh, has been of a bit of debate in the past years, uh, ranging from where the tribunals, arbitral tribunals can actually uh, look at human rights issues uh, when they consider investment disputes uh, to uh, the question whether states may have a counterclaim, a valid counterclaim uh, um, to, to hold investors accountable uh, uh, for fulfilling uh, fundamental human rights, uh, as I was mentioning earlier, the Urbaser case. Uh, so it is a space that we still have to watch and hence uh, the timeliness of, of, of the lecture today. Um, most uh, often that we see, however, in international investment arbitration uh, is using uh, the human rights or looking at human rights uh, in the interpretation uh, as an interpretative tool in the interpretation of treaties and in particular of different standards found in international investment agreements. And I was referring earlier to the uh, value that most probably the advisory opinions uh, uh, of, uh, of the International Court of Justice, of the Inter-American Court and so on, will help uh, uh, also in, in, uh, in the interpretation that will be considered by investment tribunals as such. So we, we could see, or we at least in the past, uh, the presence of human rights and the interaction between human rights and investment arbitration quite a, 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 a interestingly in investment arbitration, uh, but the submission is given the space where we are now and the moment in which we, we found ourselves in this transition to uh, a clean energy, uh, climate change mit mit mitigation, adaptation, increased regulation by states, uh, phasing out of different investments, we're going to see an increased uh, interaction between human rights and uh, investment law and arbitration. Um, the challenge that comes, however, um, and and uh, this this is something that we could see uh, dealt with um, quite differently by arbitral tribunals, is in um, what tribunals can do. Uh, being at the end of the uh, uh, of the course, obviously you have a good picture, and and uh, the rest of the audience will have a good picture on what tribunals can do and what tribunals cannot do, and the fact that tribunals, even in investment arbitration uh, uh, of of space, they have a mandate they have to fulfill. They operate in the mandate within the mandate that is granted to them, and therefore that they, they can only do as much as they can in that uh, framework uh, that is given to them. One of the um, significant elements or, or, or uh, uh, fundamental 
uh, elements that is of, of the mandate of the arbitral tribunal is the applicable law. Uh, in investment arbitration, obviously different from commercial disputes, uh, the issue of applicable law is probably uh, more contentious and uh, um, we could see, uh, for example, at the level of, uh, uh, or in the context of uh, disputes uh, involving EU member states, intra-EU disputes, uh, or the, the, the increased debate about the relevance of EU law, for example, uh, as applicable law in investment disputes. But all in all, um, the question of applicable law is one that is critical when it comes to, uh, um, let's say, um, enforcing human rights uh, and, and, and not necessarily human rights, but instruments that are dealing with human rights, uh, international instruments uh, um, uh, dealing with human rights. So the one question that will be critical in this context of the mandate of the arbitral tribunal uh, and how the tribunal will decide the dispute is the choice of law clauses in uh, the relevant uh, treaty. And what we see nowadays probably uh, unsatisfactory uh, uh, in the old generation treaties that the choice of law clauses are either inexistent uh, or if they exist, they they uh, uh, they are too broad or too ambiguous um, uh, for the tribunals to have the confidence to be able to, for example, look at the Paris Agreement uh, or uh, other treaties that, for example, impose international commitments on states um, and, and more broadly uh, on uh, uh, individuals, including businesses. Um, of course, in the context of treaty interpretation, tribunals can probably have a um, uh, um, a, a bold approach, uh, staying within the, their mandate. Uh, and of course, uh, we look at, in particular, Article 31 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties and Paragraph 3 in particular, uh, when, uh, when uh, we have the uh, uh, interpretation of the treaties, uh, including any subsequent practice in the application of treaties, but any subsequent agreement in the interpretation of the treaties, where there is a, a more space of maneuver of states themselves uh, considering the application of the treaty and their international commitments when it comes to environmental obligations, for example. Uh, now, what we see specifically in, uh, uh, if, if, if we look at the human right aspect, uh, life, clean environment, uh, um, uh, in, uh, environmental obligations at international level, uh, obviously uh, the investment agreements, the treaties, they take different approaches. Uh, and that's, as I was saying, one of the, um, uh, let's say, um, reasons why tribunals are slightly reluctant to be upfront with upholding or importing uh, this uh, international commitments when it comes to disputes. What we see is a lot of preambular provisions, for example, uh, but also very interesting, uh, uh, quite recent treaty of 2012 between Austria and Tajikistan, uh, which uh, in the generous preamble looks at uh, um, uh, UN Global Compact looks at, uh, um, uh, obviously speaking about the protection environment, uh, looking at uh, um, um, the international commitments in respect for human rights. Um, also, we have the example of the more recent uh, 2016 Czech Republic uh, model BIT, uh, which looks at the also promotion and, and uh, protection of investment, but in a manner that is consistent with the protection of environment as well. Um, all these are, um, of course, as, as you know, as a preambular provision, uh, they are obviously have a relevance in the interpretation of the treaty, uh, but they would not uh, um, impose obviously, or they would not give the tribunal that confidence I was talking about in, in uh, making sure that environmental obligations, international commitments uh, in the absence of a more elaborate applicable law provision uh, are considered in the respective dispute. Uh, what probably will be the focus of the attention in the next year, and we, 
we, we can see this already happening uh, is what I said, what I mentioned earlier, uh, that is uh, the regulatory space of the states and the fact that the states uh, increasingly um, have uh, the need to regulate in order to fulfill and protect fundamental human rights, including the right to a clean environment, and also into implementing their international obligations in the sphere of environmental protection, climate change, in the uh, internal space. So the right to regulate of the state is going to be uh, uh, the focus of the, I would say, the next years uh, to come. Uh, what we see now in the investment treaties, um, uh, we have a bit of a split uh, between the old generation of treaties and new generation of treaties. And in particular, um, uh, in the way or in, in terms of how the right to regulate uh, is approached uh, expressly. Now, there is no doubt and, and uh, no tribunal and, and no investor up to date uh, has come forward to challenge that there is a sovereign right of the states to regulate in the public interest, which includes the right to life. Um, and to uh, uh, environmental protection. Uh, uh, this is a sovereign right that is recognized irrespective of what is uh, written in these treaties, irrespective of, of the codification of the right to regulate uh, in this uh, uh, international commitments. What is debated is how the right to regulate has to be considered in connection with um, the parallel obligations of the state undertaken to promote and pro protect investments. For example, uh, uh, talking about specifically climate change mitigation and adaptation, if uh, uh, a state has to shut down uh, um, the nuclear power plants, the question is one, and this is uh, uh, for protecting the uh, right to a clean environment, um, uh, the question is what happens with the investors that have invested substantial capital uh, in this very expensive upfront um, investment such as a nuclear power plant. And, 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 and in any case, uh, any other example in the energy space, uh, these are investments that of course require a substantial commitment of capital upfront with the expectation of returns and profits uh, uh, in a very uh, uh, long uh, span of time uh, of tens of years. So the question is uh, how to balance uh, it's not one of recognizing the right of the state to regulate uh, because the states have the obligation to fulfill and protect human rights, but rather how this uh, right to regulate, which is at the same time an obligation of the states, can be balanced against the right, the acquired right of investors. And circling back to what I mentioned earlier, the increasing need to attract foreign investments in order to fulfill the international commitments are mentioning the trillions per year to um, a renewable, for renewable energy resources, but also for the economies to transition to uh, clean resources. So the question in the treaty has to be put in a way, uh, uh, we still need investments, but at the same time, we need to uh, broaden the regulatory space of the states. So there is a quite a divide between old generation treaties and new generation treaties, uh, uh, spanning from um, uh, no mention whatsoever of the right of the state to regulate, no mention of exemptions, uh, to uh, maybe just a, a, a very simple language uh, acknowledging that the states have the right to regulate. Um, and uh, um, uh, perhaps, for example, CETA, the Comprehensive Economic Free Trade Agreement between uh, Canada and the European Union, where there is a mention uh, that um, uh, uh, there is um, uh, uh, obviously this regulatory space of the state in the public interest, including environmental uh, concerns uh, and, um, and this uh, is expected to be done by the states. 
Um, also, um, a few mentions uh, are, uh, in the preamble of the old generation treaties, um, which again, uh, as I was mentioning under the Vienna Convention of the Law Treaties, have an interpretative value uh, rather than uh, a hard law obligation in the treaty. Uh, some uh, references in the national treatment provisions um, uh, also may be prudential measures. Um, uh, as we can see in the 2019 uh, Vietnam uh, Investment Protection Agreement uh, or in the CPTPP that is uh, obviously closer to uh, where we are today. Uh, <clears throat> now, in the new generation treaties, we see an increased, um, uh, let's say, uh, uh, focus of the treaties in dealing with the right to regulate. Uh, however, uh, one concern that continues to, uh, to, to, I would say, be uh, rather avoided by the language of the treaties is what happens, as I was saying, if the state does indeed regulate, what are the conditions uh, for a lawful uh, implementation of the right to regulate? Um, of course, it has to be done in public interest. Uh, it has to be done uh, uh, respecting due process. Uh, is there any need for a proportionality test, for example, between the measures taking and the negative consequences suffered by investors? Um, if there is uh, uh, where the burden of proof lies, for example, uh, the right to regulate is raised as a defense by the state and therefore the state has the burden of proving uh, or is uh, uh, the investor that has to uh, 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 take the lead on the burden of proof because obviously the state uh, has to uh, fulfill the obligation uh, to uh, protect and fulfill human rights. Um, at the same time, the question that uh, who is going to bear the risk uh, or the negative consequences of the right to regulate, because obviously the investor will be uh, in a position that it will not have an investment. Uh, and as I was mentioning, at least in the energy field, investments are very expensive and upfront capital must be uh, put at the disposal uh, immediately. Who bears uh, the, 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 the risk of losing the money? Uh, and this is something that treaties fail to clarify. Is this going to be the state paying the investor? Uh, if that is the case, how much the investor will, will be paid and so on. Uh, just a quick note uh, for those interested and is with uh, open access. Uh, I've uh, recently published with uh, uh, Rishi Joshi and Kabir Dugal a very interesting uh, empirical uh, research on the recent trends in investment arbitration on the right to regulate environment, health, and corporate social responsibility. It was published in the Exit Review um, uh, this year. It's open access, so uh, just uh, anybody can uh, read this. Uh, uh, we looked at uh, the past three years, um, at the new generation of treaties, and if the states, um, in consideration of the fact that there is going to be an increased need for regulation, in particular in this context of climate change, if states, uh, uh, by, by way of treaties, they're indeed uh, enlarging or uh, make this regulatory space more comfortable to them, but also addressing the concerns of investors that uh, their rights and obligations, their rights have to respect it. And at the same time, uh, the, the obligations of the states uh, towards the investments have to be fulfilled. Uh, and and uh, uh, quite interestingly, um, we came to the conclusion that um, there is not much out there, um, including in the, in the new generation of treaties. Indeed, there is uh, uh, there are more provisions addressing the regulatory space of the states, but not um, all these critical elements that I mentioned earlier. What are the conditions uh, for a lawful exercise of the right to regulate? Uh, who will pay the price of regulation. This is not something still uh, that we see uh, in the treaty. Uh, but I think more critically uh, in the regulatory space, um, in, the, in this very uh, critical discussion um, uh, for, for, for the um, a regulatory space of the state uh, in the context of climate change is what will happen from now on. Uh, 
Uh, the UNCITRAL Working Group Free, uh, for those less familiar with the work of the uh, Working Group Free of the United Nations Commission of International Trade Law, uh, it looks at the reform of investor state dispute settlement. Uh, it, it, it is already in the fifth year of the mandate and another four left. Um, currently, um, uh, before the um, uh, working group free prepared by the uh, UNCITRAL Secretariat, there is a paper on a uh, um, uh, reform on procedural and uh, cross-cutting issues. Uh, it is a collection of, uh, as I call it, a collection of provisions uh, addressing critical concerns with investor state dispute settlement. These are procedural issues, uh, as I mentioned, um, and they range from um, uh, the damages, uh, uh, counterclaims, third-party funding, denial of benefits, uh, uh, and the right to regulate. So a, a large uh, 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 specter of, of, of provisions uh, that are critical to uh, investor state dispute settlement. In particular, the right to regulate uh, draft provision that is suggested, um, and the, the discussion has started in Vienna uh, in October this year, and it will continue in January next year, also in Vienna. Uh, the, the right to regulate provision is probably uh, different from what we've seen in the treaty so far. Uh, uh, in in um, uh, Obviously, it, it uh, uh, confirms the right uh, to regulate of the state, the sovereign right to regulate, um, that uh, 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 also the fact that investments are made um, uh, in, with regard to protection of public health, safety, environment, and so on. Uh, but paragraph three of the proposed draft provision, which again, it is uh, still under discussion, so it's it's on the table, uh, provides that no claim may be submitted uh, for resolution when it comes to uh, the measures adopted by states uh, to protect public health, public safety, and the environment, including compliance with the Paris Agreement um, or any principle of commitment uh, in the context of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, based on which the COPs are held. Uh, this is, uh, I, I would say, a radical proposal because uh, obviously on the face of it, this is a self-judging provision, uh, meaning that if the state will uh, adopt a regulatory measure uh, in implementing their commitments uh, with respect to environmental protection, including climate change, uh, a claim, uh, for example, of an investor uh, related to this uh, uh, regulation would not be able to be submitted for resolution um, and, and therefore um, will probably not see uh, the 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 continued uh, criticism of the regulatory chill that we, we nowadays see. Uh, the second, um, I would say, comment to this provision is that indeed it would uh, clarify the situation whether um, there is any responsibility of states uh, when it comes to measures taken um, um, in the in fulfilling their fundamental, their sovereign right to regulate in the interest of environment. Uh, that means that uh, if there is no breach of a treaty uh, that follows that there is also no compensation uh, arising out of this. Uh, I recommend that you read this paper. Uh, it is available on the website of the UNCITRAL Working Group Free. Um, again, it's, it is a paper under discussion, so not nothing is has been decided so far. Uh, uh, relevant uh, uh, in connection with the draft provision 12 on the right to regulate is also draft provision 11 on counterclaims, um, as we're going to see uh, uh, in, in, in a minute, and also draft provision 23, which deals with the assessment of damages and compensation, and which expressly uh, uh, states that any uh, non-compliance with the United Nations guiding principles um, uh, on businesses and human rights or with the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises uh, will have a result, uh, as a result, a reduction in the compensation uh, of the investments. Um, 
Now, of course, the discussion is, uh, is, is quite broad, what the treaties can do, what states can do. I was mentioning the Article 31 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties uh, that allows states to issue inter interpretive statements. This is something that the UNCTRA Working Group 3 has also indicated as a possible reform for investor state dispute settlement. Uh, and of course, this makes sense uh, in the context of my remark uh, on the mandate of the arbitral tribunal and the fact that the applicable law provisions in the existing treaties uh, are, um, are the non-existent or uh, not clear uh, as to um, what if, if a tribunal can look at international law more broadly. Now, in the last minutes, and I can see that there are some questions, but um, um, perhaps in a second, um, I'm... Um, I just have a few cases where this interaction between human rights and uh, investment arbitration, um, um, uh, I would say, uh, be became a, a bit more relevant. Um, the first case uh, we have here is Balloon versus Ghana. Uh, I'll not go into the details of the case. You, you have a summary here, but in a nutshell, uh, an investment uh, that went wrong uh, was expropriated by uh, Ghana, but at the same time, um, uh, the investor or one of the investors uh, was uh, arrested and ex expelled from the country. Uh, and uh, while the arbitral tribunal has found that there is, has been an expropriation of the assets um, of the investment um, uh, of the company, uh, it found that there were no human rights violations. Uh, in particular, when it came, as I was mentioning, uh, Antoine Billoun's uh, um, arrest uh, uh, and then the deportation uh, out of the country. Uh, interestingly, what the tribunal stated is that um, um, foreign nationals are entitled to treatment no less than that prescribed by international law. The law grants to each individual fundamental human rights, including property and personal rights. And of course, property rights uh, we see uh, frequently in, in investment arbitration in, in the context of expropriation. Um, uh, however, the tribunal found that it was not competent to pass upon every type of departure from the minimum standard to which foreign nationals are entitled or authorized to deal with allegations of violations of fundamental human rights. Uh, and as a conclusion, the tribunal's competence is limited to commercial disputes arising under the contract entered into the context of Ghana's investment code. So again, uh, 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 circling you back to the uh, what the tribunal can do, uh, the mandate of the arbitral tribunal is very important. Um, and uh, um, uh, in this context, the Ghana's investment code where the government agreed to arbitrate only disputes in respect of foreign investment uh, and other matters, including uh, uh, the human rights violation of Mr. Balloon fell outside the scope of the jurisdiction. So if we want arbitral tribunals to be able to address the issue of uh, human rights uh, broadly in the context, for example, of uh, energy transition, we also have to give the tribunal um, the, the, the framework uh, in which uh, it can do so. Uh, of course, uh, uh, one uh, often cited case is Philip Morris uh, uh, against Uruguay. Uh, Philip Morris prevailed uh, in this arbitration. Uh, the claim was submitted uh, uh, based on the bilateral investment treaty between Switzerland and Uruguay. And uh, 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 Philip Morris complained of the measures adopted by Uruguay, uh, which precluded tobacco manufacturers from marketing uh, more than one variant of cigarette per brand family, uh, and also increasing the size of graphic health warnings on the cigarette packages. Um, what was interesting is that, um, uh, besides the dissenting opinion of uh, 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 Gary Bourne, um, the arbitration also um, had uh, involved the uh, submissions of uh, the Friends of the Court or Amicus Curiae. Uh, this is a feature that in the context of human rights, broadly, uh, um, it's probably one of the um, developments that we could see in investment arbitration, uh, the fact that third parties can uh, bring their 
uh, knowledge, their information uh, to the dispute in order to assist arbitral tribunals. They are not parties to the uh, to the arbitration. They're, as the name says, they're friends of the court. Uh, they are there to support the tribunal to be to bring something new that the the parties don't bring. In this case, the World Health Organization uh, and uh, 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 other um, organization for the. Uh, for example, the Pan American Health Organizations um, intervene as amicus curiae in, in the arbitration. Uh, what is important in the case um, was uh, the, the majority of the tribunal, as I said, Gary Bourne dissented, uh, held that the ad uh, adoption of the challenge measures was a legitimate exercise of power uh, by Uruguay for the safekeeping of its public health. Uh, that is uh, 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 the right to regulate the police powers of the state, uh, noting that the bilateral investment treaty did not preclude Uruguay in exercising its sovereign powers in regulating harm of harmful products uh, in order to safeguard public health. Um, and furthermore, uh, obviously, the uh, decision that was taken by Uruguay in adopting this measure was based on strong scientific consensus uh, that uh, uh, on the lethal eff effects of tobacco. Now, Gary Bourne dissented um, on the basis of the um, measures adopted by Uruguay uh, were in breach of the fair and equitable treatment under the bilateral investment treaty. Uh, all the recognized that Uruguay had the sovereign power uh, uh, to regulate in the, in the interest of health. Uh, um, Professor uh, Gary Bourne considered that the measures adopted were arbitrary and unreasonable with no meaning of meaningful study, discussion, deliberation, or consultation with the industry. So you see here uh, evident what I was mentioning earlier that uh, a balance uh, between the commitments of states towards investors, the fact that the states uh, are committed to provide fair and equitable treatment to investors, um, uh, also legitimate expectations as part of the fair and equitable treatment, uh, and the fact that the state has the power to regulate in the public interest, including health issues. Um, another interesting case uh, is Suez versus Argentina. Uh, and uh, this is interesting from the perspective of the applicable law that I was mentioning earlier. Uh, the fact that um, uh, the tribunal found that uh, um, uh, our bilateral investment treaties cannot be um, uh, isolated, they have to be looked in the uh, context of international law. It's something that I mentioned earlier, we are moving uh, away from fragmentation of international public international law into a more interaction between the uh, arms between the, the the parts of international law and this is something that the tribunal in Suez versus Argentina emphasized uh, Argentina is subject to both international obligations human rights and treaty obligations and must respect them both uh, of both of them equally um, under the circumstances of these cases Argentina's human rights obligation, and its investment treaty obligation are not inconsistent, contradictory, or mutually exclusive, uh, and both type of obligations have to be uh, uh, respected by the uh, by the states. Uh, Urba Ser versus Argentina is the case I mentioned earlier where the counterclaim by Argentina uh, was uh, uh, allowed at the, uh, as a matter of jurisdiction, uh, but was uh, rejected on the merits. Um, it is very. Uh, uh, it it is a very important uh, case. Um, something that probably in the future we'll see an evolution of it. We have already started seeing this. Uh, I was mentioning uh, the states have the the obligation to protect and fulfill human rights. This is what the tribunal Urbaser versus Argentina has stated. It is not upon the investors to perform the duty of the states to fulfill and protect human rights. Um, but what is important in this context is, is the fact that the counterclaim was allowed, which is already uh, uh, at the jurisdictional uh, stage, which is already a, a step forward. Uh, and also um, the uh, fact that, again, what the Swiss Tribunal emphasized, bilateral investment treaties cannot be seen in isolation. Uh, the tribunal in Urbaser said, uh, uh, 
uh, the, the Argentina-Spain bilateral investment treaty refers in the context of applicable law uh, at the general principles of international law. And the tribunal has stated that such reference would be meaningless if the position would be retained that the bilateral investment treaty is to be construed as an isolated set of rules of international law. Uh, this is where, uh, of course, the wording of the treaty is important. Uh, it is important to uh, uh, make references to the is this international treaties, but also the applicable law provision in the treaty to be uh, wide enough to allow arbitral tribunals to be able to look at this international commitments by states, for example, by way of the Paris Agreement and beyond that. Uh, I have mentioned already the participation of the Amici Curie in investment arbitration. Um, the, the discussion about allowing interested parties in the arbitration, uh, of course, is uh, has increased in the past years. The nature of investment disputes as such, um, uh, while investments obviously are private commercial uh, endeavors, uh, uh, they affect uh, or may affect uh, 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 societal interests. Uh, we could see this uh, uh, broadly uh, in, in the context of, of um, investment arbitration. It can be the, the environment, it can be indigenous population, uh, uh, any societal interest that one can think of uh, may pop up in this arbitration. And therefore, uh, also the increased need of transparency of this investment uh, disputes, uh, but also the need to allowing the societal interest to be present in these arbitrations. However, on the other hand of it is the private nature of arbitration as a dispute resolution mechanism, and also the mandate given to the arbitral tribunal. Uh, as you know uh, and, and mentioned already, uh, the arbitration is based on party autonomy, uh, the consent of the parties, the mandate given to the arbitral tribunal, and enlarging the sphere of participants in an arbitration can only be based, based on the consent uh, to arbitrate. Uh, a, a halfway solution in this allowing the societal interests present at the table, uh, uh, in addition to the increased transparency of this investment disputes, is allowing this amici courier or non-disputing party or friends of the courts to participate in the arbitration and to bring something to the tribunal that the parties cannot bring themselves. Uh, and we've seen in the past, uh, starting from the Methanex uh, case, the first um, case, uh, the first tribunal uh, uh, under NAFTA, uh, under the UNCITRAL rules, to allow the participation of, of uh, uh, the, the free NGOs, the, um, Communities for a Better Environment, Blue Water Network of uh, Earth Island Institute and the Center for International Environmental Law. Uh, we've seen a string of interest uh, present at the table uh, and tribunals allowing the presence of Amicus Curiae when the conditions for that would be fulfilled. Acknowledging at the same time that allowing this participation would increase the cost and duration of uh, of the arbitrations, but this can be balanced in the in the light of the interest presented by this amici curia. Um, so far, uh, uh, we we've seen uh, by the NGOs in particular when uh, the dispute uh, related to environmental concerns, we've seen um, the participation of NGO amici curia in in these arbitrations. Um, uh, in the Philip Morris and Uruguay, I've mentioned already, the tribunal emphasized that these organizations, the World Health Organizations uh, and so on, they uh, uh, contribute with their particular knowledge and expertise uh, in this arbitration. Um, now, probably one last uh, point of comment um, of the lecture today, just uh, hope, hoping that I put uh, the discussion in perspective uh, when it comes to the relevance of, of human rights in the arbitration, but also the fact that we are going to see an increasing need to take a look at this um, uh, topic in the years to come in light of the increased need uh, of the transition to a clean energy, uh, the in increase uh, uh, regulatory space of the states, but also the the, the need of uh, fostering and promoting investments in order to achieve the climate change goals uh, is the fact that 
um, we see human rights outside uh, and more broadly uh, um, uh, interacting with arbitration in general. Uh, one discussion that uh, uh, has been put forward in the, in the past year and recently uh, the former uh, president of the European Court of Human Rights, um, uh, Robert Spano, has um, uh, brought our attention back to what the European Court of Human Rights uh, have uh, um, held in the past uh, that um, uh, an arbitral award uh, in itself uh, generates a right to property, uh, which is a fundamental human right. Uh, in 2022, in BTS Holding versus Slovak Republic, uh, this was broadly uh, brought again to our attention in the context of investment arbitration and the fact that uh, if some states um, do not fulfill their obligations arising out of um, uh, investment arbitral awards, uh, this would uh, be the equivalent of a breach of um, or, or failure to respect the fundamental right uh, to property. Uh, so we see this increased interaction uh, in other areas um, in, in international arbitration. And again, confirming the fact that uh, we have to look at uh, international law and public international law in interaction and uh, uh, not in fragmentation, as uh, we um, uh, stated in the past. Uh, I will stop my sharing the screen at this moment, and uh, I think there are quite many comments, um, but also um, I think some questions. Um, and if I'm allowed to just take a look at the first one, uh, most of the discussion on ISDS reform is centered on procedural reform, how these reforms could give a, uh, could give account on the growing relevance of human rights. Um, yes, as, as I was saying, um, the, the mandate of the working group three of the UNCITRAL is uh, focusing on procedural issues, uh, but as you could see in the in my example of the draft provision 12 on the right to regulate, also referring to counterclaim and damages, uh, there is a fine line between substance and the procedure. Um, one uh, point that probably will not, uh, the working group two will not do is to, to look uh, purely at substantive uh, standards of protection. For example, it will not uh, address, for example, fair and equitable treatment and expropriation. Uh, this is not within the mandate granted. And this is one of the criticisms that was put forward that a comprehensive reform of the ISDS uh, would not be possible in the absence of the reform of the substance uh, of, of investment law. Uh, but at the same time, at the beginning of the works of the working group, uh, free. This was uh, opposed by the participating states, by the UNCITRAL member states, uh, and emphasized that in particular when it comes to bilateral commitments, uh, it is essential to keep this feature because states have their own interests, their own priorities, and this can only be addressed usually in a bilateral uh, manner or at the maximum at the re regional level, as we could see, for example, with the CPTPP. Um, and the second question, uh, I think it refers to counterclaims. Uh, and the question is, um, in, in, in the broader the interpretation uh, by arbitral tribunals of investors uh, human rights obligation I think we're going to see this uh, I think I think what we are going to see because most of the discussion uh, relates to balancing investment obligation we must not forget that investment arbitration uh, was put forward the investment law was put forward to address an imbalance in the system. Yeah, the fact that the state, an investor investing in a whole state is captive in that system and the only remedy would be before the courts of that state uh, and, and it would be at the discretion of the uh, whole state and the investment. So actually the, the, the discussion should be focused on the fact that investment law and arbitration uh, is there to address an imbalance. Uh, uh, and, and what we're going to see in the future, something that I, I uh, advocated uh, in the past is that we're going to see a 
increased regulation of investments. Uh, and, and we can see this, for example, in the um, um, in the Ecuador model BIT, I'm not sure if it was mentioned in any in any comments, the 2018 uh, uh, model BIT of Ecuador, which expressly states that investments must bring a positive contribution uh, uh, to the whole state in full respect of human rights and in the environment. So what we're going to see by state regulation, uh, uh, we're, we will see investments complying with, uh, with what the states have put forward as a policy. Uh, and I think I, I answered the questions here and um, I'll give the floor back to, um, to the hosts. I think we have another question from yes. Franco Pantocino. As I guess as... maybe, maybe Claudio, okay. Franco, and then I I want to make uh, some closing words and then open the floor for more questions. Professors, thank you very much. Thank you. Rina, uh, thank you so much for your thought-provoking presentation. Uh, I've got a comment and a question uh, that is not uh, by my personal uh insight, but uh, I saw recently the Tobit Londres Alexander lecture. So I would really like to comment something that uh, is related to also the BIT uh, from Ecuador on, of 2018. So mm. I, I would like to have it just a liberty for two, uh, two minutes to uh, comment the situation. In 2012, uh, Copper Mesa sued Ecuador for alleged violations of the Canada Ecuador bid 1996. Copper Mesa secured three concessions from the Ecuadorian government to conduct open case of uh, copper mining in the Intact Valley that implied devastating ecological impact. The removal of sections of mountain waste material to be dumped in the main river, forcible eviction of communities from their heritage lands. Copper Mesa met with understandable local resistance, and in response, it adopts a shockingly aggressive stance including hiring paramilitary forces. They sought massive uh, damages of about uh, 20, 73 million, and ultimately the investors succeeded in their claim, and Ecuador had an award against it for about 19.4 million US dollars. Regardless of the substantive rights and grounds of that decision, I, I would really like to ask about the problems and the inflammation the arbitral investment proceeding uh, creates itself. Uh, and this is very clearly uh, represented by uh, the participation of the local uh, community itself, because members of these uh, local communities spoke of this on a documental that it's actually uh, publicly uh, available. And that documental showed that uh, they spoke about the terror of the violent confrontations with investors the trauma of the impeding uh, destruction of their community, but particularly, and this is very interesting in the international investment discussion, about the terms of the arbitration process itself. So some members of the community traveled to Washington DC and uh, with people uh, in a language that they did not understand, right? In the World Bank building, and they waited for days to participate in the hearings and. Finally, they said that they had a moment for uh, uh, a speak in the proceedings. So my question is, taking this in consideration, what procedural innovations do you think are necessary to think and discuss and incorporate within the ISTS uh, in light of the urgent necessity to include human rights consideration in the investment system? Sorry for well, the uh, long comments. Franco, the, the, this is this is uh, this is very timely, and uh, and uh, I was uh, two points. The first one is obviously the states have the their treaty makers, treaty takers, and treaty let's say treaty givers. Uh, their host states, home states, but also treaty makers. So wearing all these free hats, they have to consider the drafting of the treaties. So at the level of treaty drafting, this is essential. And, and there are various explanations why the treaties do not address the significant concerns you have mentioned. Uh, so states can do more. They can also do more by way of interpretation. 
uh, uh, but at the same time, one has to think that there are tools there um, and there is transparency. And if you look at, for example, the the uh, we did this exercise uh, uh, recently with uh, with a colleague of mine looking at the uh, YouTube channel of the World Bank, uh, looking at the views of the hearings, how many views, how many of us in the audience have actually watched those hearings in the name of transparency made available there. And you'd be shocked of the low lumber. And you'll also be shocked by the, the empty rooms uh, at Ixid or otherwise made available to the uh, uh, public uh, uh, in, in the name of transparency. Uh, uh, and the fact that there is an open call, for example, DR Kafta tribunals, they issue an open call for amateur career for non-disputing party participation. And, and there's nobody uh, in most of the cases or very few. So the tools are there. Uh, uh, or most of the tools are there, but we also have the limitation, as I was saying, of the mechanism itself. You cannot do uh, more than the arbitration permits as by the very nature. So what, what UNCITRAL is doing now with the reforms, it's an option, it's great to have more options, but at the same time, the states have to consider their priorities. And if the priority of the state is not to have explicit language in the treaty, uh, that's not to be put on the investors. So I, I think there is there the, the discussion, as I was saying, is broader uh, and, and the concerns uh, obviously are valid. I'll give back to, to uh, Professor Moore. Thank you very much, Professor, for your wonderful and brilliant presentation the conference this morning. It was full of people. So on behalf of the uh, International Law Department, of the University of Chile Law School and also the Santiago Arbitration and Mediation Chamber, Camp Santiago. We are delighted to have you this morning with all of us. Many people came also. I think you also raised a lot of interesting topics that also gave uh, for good uh, questions that you properly answered. So I think we are very happy and it, is, it was an honor to have you with us today. Thank you very much. So Claudio, I don't know, I will give you the floor in case there are some more comments or questions and then we will finish this event. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you very much, much Professor Ma. Thank you uh, very much, uh, both of you, and also to, to Franco. And I think there is no more comment or, or questions, so we can finish here. Thank you very much. All the best wishes. And again, thank you to the University of Chile and to Camp Santiago for this excellent program and to all in the audience for being present today. We hope, hope to see you again and to be able to participate in the future editions of this diploma. So thank, thank you very much. Bye, all of you. Thank Goodbye. You. Goodbye. Thank you very much, everyone. Goodbye. Goodbye.